Mr. Wilder, you came into the film industry over here, I think, from the German film industry. That is correct, yes. I came in 1934. There were two uh, waves of uh, German uh, picture makers coming to America. The first one in the 20s, those were the, the real great ones who were hired in uh, in Germany, uh, put under contract and brought over. They were Ernst Lubitsch and uh, uh, Murnau and Emil Jennings and uh, Konrad Veit. They also hired Swedish picture makers like Systrem. Um, the second German wave came after the advent of Mr. Hitler. In other words, the refugees. We came without a job, and I'm talking now about uh, about uh, Peter Lorre or um, Fritz Lang. I think he did have a uh, a contract when he came in. That was in the around 34, 35. Um, a whole slew of uh, uh, writers, composers, among the writers even uh, a Bert Brecht and the. Thomas Mann, I don't know what he was looking for a job, but in any case, they they came here not because um, because uh, they were um, picked as uh, the talented ones. Uh, we came we came uh, very simply to 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 save our lives. Some of us uh, German picture makers. And I was a writer, at, having been a newspaper man in Vienna and Berlin. I had been a writer at the old Ufa. Uh, some uh, uh, wanted to stay on uh, in German-speaking countries. They went uh, foolhardily to Vienna or to Prague, thinking that it's not going to happen there. Uh, I uh, I chose to uh, to uh, to go to Paris and bide my time there until I can uh, find enough money or a visa to come to the United States, and I did that without speaking a word of English. So uh, that was sort of a big jump. I was a writer then to come uh, to come to a country um, uh, as a writer without um, without uh, being able to write in English. Well, I came in 1934, and um, this is now 40, uh, 44 years that I've been here. What was the attraction of America as opposed to some of the other countries your associates went to? Well. Uh, to begin with, you know, this is uh, what is the attraction for a painter in uh, uh, Czechoslovakia, in Bulgaria, or in Vienna, or in the Argentines to go to Paris. This is where a painter, a sculptor goes. Even without Hitler, my ambition naturally would have been to come to Hollywood because this is where it was at. It just accelerated it, really. It accelerated it, absolutely. It. Now, when you got over here... Um, getting into the film industry, was that difficult or easy? Enormously difficult. I I sort of um, uh, dragged my behind, you know, uh, along the, 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 the asphalt of the then popular Hollywood Boulevard, which is now uh, gone. I uh, I shared a room with Peter Lorre at that time. We, we, were, we were hungry most of the time. I was trying to learn as quickly as possible. Uh, enough English to, to be able to communicate. Whatever I wrote, original stories, they were translated into English. But uh, shortly after that, I must say, it just lasted uh, no more, and that is remarkable, you know, because uh, I, was, uh, I would have settled for 10 years, but uh, in 1937, uh, I, uh, I sold a story, uh, a treatment, a something to Paramount, and I stayed on there for 18 years. And so at Paramount, you met Mr. Zucker? Well, you did not really meet Mr. Zucker because Mr. Zucker uh, was uh, not anymore the great power at Paramount. He was based in New York. Wonderful old man, Mr. Zucker. You know, that beautiful anecdote of his, which um, I, I hold very dear. Whenever he came out here lately, I mean, he died when he was like, I think, 102 or 103, and he always used to go to the Hillcrest Country Club for lunch and watched the golfing or whatever. And one day he told to somebody, 
He says, you know, if I would have known I'm going to get to be that old, I would have taken better care of myself. That was very good old for Adolf Zucker. His son was then one of the executives. But, uh, and this, I think, is, uh, is uh, the, the main thrust of your reportage, uh, à la recherche des mogules perdus. Uh, it was, naturally, it was a completely, totally different atmosphere when I came here. In the middle 30s, there were, in full bloom, the Louis B. Mayers, the Xanax, the Warner Brothers, the uh, Harry Cones. It, the rubber barons had their enclaves and uh, they kept a very tight rein on uh, their stables and they were huge, those stables, because I remember I, I was a writer at Paramount and we, at that time we had 104 writers under contract. Now, when I say uh, Paramount had, 100, uh, had 104, that means that Metro, which was much bigger, had 160, and Warner's had 130, and, uh, and uh, they we were in our cubicles uh, on the fourth floor at Paramount, or the Writer's Annex, or the Writer's Annex Annex, and we were typing away, constructing stories, there, there we had kind of, once you had a deal and you were going on a screenplay, I remember every every Thursday or Friday we had to deliver 11 pages all of them on yellow paper that was the first draft as it were uh, but you must remember that uh, we, 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 were, we were engaged in a huge manufacturing uh, town uh, Detroit uh, with automobiles a Youngstown, Ohio in steel there were four or five hundred pictures made a year all of that started kind of uh, going, uh, going uh, by the wayside uh, the idea, I mean, uh, the, 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 the MGM uh, uh, empire, more stars than they are in heaven. I mean, the idea, for instance, is that somebody had a, a, a picture and said, my God, this would be just absolutely marvelous. I'm talking now about Paramount. If he could get but Gene Kelly, the idea of even daring to call uh, the, the, the powers and say, could we get Gene Kelly? That was just like, uh, like uh, uh, asking... Uh, Prince Rainier, can I, can I take uh, uh, Princess Grace for a weekend to Acapulco? I mean, that was untouchable, absolutely untouchable. And uh, or or uh, to get a Emil Jannings or a Carol Lombard from Paramount, there were uh, great big uh, uh, exemptions and famous ones that uh, uh, Clark Gable was on uh, on. Uh, on the skids at that time, he had just made a picture called Parnell, where they put him in a beard, and it just did not come off. And that luminous star kind of was uh, uh, in descendancy. And uh, there was a very, very hot director at Columbia called Capra. And uh, they, uh, they did loan, uh, uh, lend, rather, MGM lend them Mr. Clark Gable for It Happened One Night. But they were tough. Now, in order to, for Mr. Selznick, uh, who was the son-in-law of uh, Mr. Louis B. Mayer, in order to get Clark Gable to play Red Butler in Gone with the Wind, they had to give them the release. Oops, the release. No shot, nothing. Just the blind going up. In case you're wondering in England when you hear this transcription, if you can understand what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, they had to... MGM contracted for the release of uh, Gone with the Wind. Now we're talking now, as it turns out, about millions and millions and millions of dollars. You know. So they were tightly run uh, uh, fortresses, as it were, and uh, every studio was making 60, 80 pictures, 100 pictures a year. We did not then have uh, the great big uh, 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 invention, uh, the monster, if you want to call it, called television. But actually, it started, it started crumbling, in my opinion, once uh, there was that uh, antitrust divorce suit brought up, and uh, and uh, the picture industry overscared. You know, we have an industry that is constantly scared that Washington may do something for them. In other countries, the, 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 the government subsidizes the picture industry. 
and surely the American picture industry, with all the crap that has been going on, has done an enormous, a fabulous job of uh, selling the United States to the world. And yet, never a penny has been given. There were only obstacles uh, uh, in the way, and they were always scared, scared shitless, if I may say the word, you're going to edit it out, of, of uh, what? Now, they come, they came the divorce suit, in other words, a studio, or studios, in those days. They had the manufacturing uh, facilities, their studios, and they also were owners of theaters where they could show their pictures. Hundreds and thousands of pictures in Egypt, in Buenos Aires, uh, in, uh, in Indianapolis, in Berlin, all over the world. And suddenly they have decided that uh, um, it is uh, against the antitrust law to both manufacture and to, uh, and to, uh, to, to show to uh, the... Uh, in other words, in other words uh, that they can be manufacturers and retailers, as it were. Peculiarly enough, uh, the, the, the oil business, the mobiles and the shells uh, and uh, the rich fields uh, and uh, all the other companies uh, who are not running scared. In fact, they're running the country. They're electing presidents. They still have their stations where they're selling the gas all over the country and all over the world for that matter. But in any case, that was the very beginning, an antitrust it is one of the one of those peculiar things where, for instance, if uh, Paramount decided to um, go into business together to buy up, let us say, Columbia Pictures, that is antitrust. However, if you if you are in the uh, let us say breakfast food business, Quaker Oats, they can buy Paramount that they don't know how to make pictures, that is a whole different story, but this is not antitrust anymore. Well, in any case, to, to between, between, between this first erosion of a market, because you made a dog of a picture, and the picture cost, I'm talking about the then days, a million dollars, and uh, nowadays it would be uh, rotting on the shelves, they still pushed it through their own theaters and they recovered like eight, nine hundred thousand dollars at the small loss. But now, uh, uh, this being sort of a, a, a buyer's market, not quite true really because uh, the great pictures, you know, they're standing in line and the studios are applying tremendous pressure. But I'm talking about the medium picture, I'm not talking about, about uh, uh, Jaws or about uh, Close Encounters of a Third Kind or Godfather. But the, the medium uh, picture that is so-so, uh, that, of course, uh, that, of course uh, fell by the wayside. Now, the second thing that happened that uh, brought this thing uh, to an, uh, kind of a, uh, an inglorious uh, end that is completely kind of different now than it was then is the advent of television. In other words, the, the studios run by the moguls, the scrap iron dealers, the tailors, uh, in the case of Goldwyn, the glove salesmen, you know. They came with money, they came with the passion, and they were gamblers. That died out. What made that business so great, which attracted those people, was that in those days, movies were oxygen for, 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 for the populace of the world. Like goldfish, you know, people had to go up for the oxygen to breathe once in a while. They, people just went twice a week to see a movie. I hope that was an intentional pun. Which one? Goldfish. goldfish and, uh, well, uh, it, it was, I didn't mean it, so, but the uh, name was Goldfish. Uh, uh, but this, the, the, the so-called habit, they were, selling, they were selling bread, they were selling something, an absolute total necessity to feed their dreams, to feed their heart, their imagination, to get them out of the house. But now, uh, uh, with television, with the advent of television, the whole thing has changed, you know. It has to be something absolutely special for them to go. People not only don't go on Tuesday and Friday to see the new shows, they already know on Tuesday what picture they will see on Friday because they have read the reviews, they talk to neighbors, they talk to people in the office, 
they have to be very, very sure that they're going to see something really good, something they want to see. Not necessarily in a very high level, but something exciting, something, uh, uh, some kind of a new uh, John Travolta something, so that they will be induced to leave the house, to leave, uh, to leave, uh, to pack the children in the car, to uh, to brave the traffic and the the dangers of the parking, the dark parking lot, and to to plunk out a considerable amount of money. So, uh, because uh, it's much safer to sit in the house, and sometimes you see something quite uh, quite decent. You see Johnny Carson, you see Walter Cronkite, you see in between some uh, uh, something that is not uh, all that uh, uh, that worthless. Uh, then now, of course, the new advent of the cable business, you know, where you pay uh, uh, twelve dollars a month and you see uh, 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 first-run pictures, maybe a little lukewarm, but you still see them. Yeah, well, what, I, what I meant to say about those people that they were, with very, very few exceptions, uh, people who could not spell. I don't think they ever read a book. Uh, they, they, they did not know literature. They were not the founders of Old Vic. They were, they were, you did not talk to them in terms of uh, Shakespeare or, or a George Bernard Shaw play. They didn't know any of that. But... They had a kind of a smell, and they had guts, and uh, they threw you dirty curves. But you were not dealing with uh, an unknown enemy. You were not at the mercy of uh, agents who have suddenly become the ones who say uh, yes or no. Also, it, theirs is not the power. The power belongs to the Kafka figures in the background. And more than that, yes meant yes. Yes means now maybe. In those days, did no mean no, or when you went to argue it out, take me through a, a typical conversation, say, with Goldman, you, you, you disagreed with something he had said. Well, uh, uh, I would... I would, uh, I would uh, he would uh, uh, disagree with me on a scene, let us say. We, we, I only worked for him once on the loan. My collaborator, Mr. Brackett, and I, we, did, we wrote a picture for Howard Hawks called Ball of Fire. And uh, he just, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to hand somebody a scene, which is a comedy scene, and he is to read it and to laugh, that's very, very difficult. It's very difficult to make somebody to convince somebody as to what is funny. But we would just go up there and we would play the scene for him and jump all over couches and chairs and be on our knees and act it out. He, he, and all he had enough confidence in us. He had enough confidence in a first-rate director like William Wyler or like Hawks, let us say, or John Ford. He, he, he would protect them. He would, he would, uh, he would... Uh, and you could function, you know, because you were protected by that thing. And that happened in every studio, whether it was Paramount or Metro. And there were the greatest facilities at your disposal. But nowadays, by the time I get in the studio to direct, because having finished the script, and then having unending conferences, and then ultimately being turned down and having to go to get the financing for the picture, I'm in a state of total collapse. And now I have but to start and direct the picture. And then after it's finished, I now have to start and publicize the picture. You are on your own. That was all being given to your... In other words, the man who is, let us say, a fairly good fighter pilot, I have not only to build the plane myself, but I have to buy it with my own money. I have to find somebody to finance the plane before I can fly it. And then I have to put on an aerial circus to convince people, come and see my picture. All of those things were done for you, the publicity departments, the art department. Nobody worried about that. That was, that was Columbia's uh, worry. 
to get the banks to give them the money or to finance it out of the profits or MGM or 20th Century Fox. Now it is co-production and it is just, it is so pitiful and I just happen to have uh, spent some time in Cannes at the festival. And at that festival, you know, you saw all the sidewalk cafes absolutely just filled to the brim. And there would people be negotiating deals for pictures to be made. And there would be somebody from Iraq and he would be talking to somebody from Yugoslavia and they were talking about two, three, four million dollars and who they're going to get and it would be marvelous to get uh, uh, Sylvester Stallone and then we're going to have uh, you know, a lot. And at the very, very end, when that conversation was over, it took three hours, none of them could pay for the coffee which they have been drinking, you know. This kind of business. And this, I find, uh, I, I, I'm not, I'm not a, I, I'm a fairly good writer, and once in a while I make a picture, direct a picture that is a success, but I am not a, I'm not a salesman. It's not my job. It is just very simply not my job. I just, I just cannot do it. And if I do it, it is... Uh, it is uh, so totally time-consuming, you know, and all of those things now, with uh, with uh, the, the 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 unending discussions about deals and three percent of the gross and double negative and all of that, that the first billing and all of that miserable crap, that saps your strengths that you should really conserve, to making a movie, which is physically a very very exhausting thing. We didn't know that. We were we were called in, and or we were given a book or a play, or we came with an original story. All right, let's go ahead. We will take this actor, that actor. We have Spencer Tracy under contract. We have Myrna Loy. We have Bill Powell. We will and the whole and you were there and you were doing it. You were writing it. You were directing it, but they left you alone. They got off your back. What were the things that you? Disliked at that time. Ah, what I disliked at that time was that uh, that uh, 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 if you had the, the 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 most enormous hit of all times, you know, you were bound by your contract. Nobody walked out, and nobody broke the contract. There were isolated cases like that, Olivia de Havilland, seven-year deal, but uh, it is uh, it was uh, you belonged to a regiment and you went through the battle and uh, and uh, and. Uh, uh, they may give you a medal, you know, but they did not. That was the one thing. Uh, I, I, uh, uh, I, I dislike the, 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 the enormous uh, uh, dictatorial ukases uh, uh, that came from them, especially if I could not combat the, uh, the people on that point and win my point. But kind of thinking back, you know, I much prefer that to what's happening today, but then again, maybe because my memory goes back and I was young and uh, and uh, uh, I, I still had all my hair and I, uh, it was a care carefree world. Uh, it, you know, people always confuse things. You know, people just think, ah, when I was young, when milk was white. Well, milk is still white. You know, we are, we are exaggerating the thing. But right now, I find it getting on in years. And not being a, 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 a man who is, uh, who is in any way uh, uh, jealous of uh, uh, the, the nouvelle vagues that keep sweeping over the ancienne vague to which I belong. No, I'm, I, 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 I enjoy it. I love it to see a new director with stand. I just really, just, it's just marvelous for me. But it has, it ha just has become very difficult. Maybe it would be very difficult for me uh, within the shelter of the studio at this time of, the, of, my, of my career uh, to get the assignment I would, be, I would be wanting. Maybe they would give it to Coppola or to, to uh, uh, Mr. Scorsese. I don't know. But uh, uh, it it was it was there was kind of an esprit there was something, it was not just pulling against each other. It was uh, the competition was good. That say, as you, you mentioned a little earlier, 106 writers at at, uh, at at Paramount. Yes. Paramount under a sort of creative cloud, there must have been all writing away. Oh yes. What sort of? I mean, you obviously exchanged ideas. I mean, you all had to 
produce a certain amount within a certain period. Yeah. Uh, and what was what was that sort of uh, period? I mean, how much did you have to produce? Well, eleven week? pages a, a week we had to deliver. And then that was that. Those were the days when we still worked on Saturday until noon. And who read those eleven pages? Uh, that went to the story department, and it, we were assigned to a producer. This producer had like uh, eight pictures uh, under his wing. And out of uh, the material that is accumulated, he would then choose and make five. Or he would discuss with you changes. And then a director would be assigned, and he would come in on that. Yeah, but there was a constant kind of a turmoil. They were, it was humming. Cars were coming off the production line. They may not be as good as handcrafted things, like uh, Selznick went into that. And there was a literate producer... He he uh, he uh, bolted from MGM and then RKO, and he became an independent producer, and he made like only two or three pictures a year. But uh, 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 the, the whole atmosphere was better. But then again, you were you were, as I mentioned before, you were doing something that uh, that was needed, that they were hollering for, that they that they. That's what you wanted that they stood in line for. Now, with the exception of the six or eight uh, uh, $300 million grossing things and $200 million for the records from that thing, uh, something, something, something terrifying has suddenly uh, dawned on us. People can live very well without movies. They cannot live without television anymore. But they can live very well without it. So we are just, we are just, we are just kind of, we are just, maybe we are just sort of uh, uh, jerking off, as we say. Can we just talk about, can we just talk about a few of the specific personalities, actually, that you work with? I mean, you saw them as a writer, then you saw them as a writer-director, so you got pretty close yeah. to a lot of them. I mean, let's talk uh, about Harry Cohn, for instance. Harry Cohn I only knew very vaguely at one time, uh, when I left Paramount in a tiff, I then went back... Uh, they, they, they told me uh, they would like me to, to, to do uh, uh, Pal Joey. You're familiar with Pal Joey. Pal Joey is, uh, is the story of... Uh, was it a musical on Broadway? It was um, written by O'Hara the, as a series of articles, study of a character, Joey, in The New Yorker, and then it was made into a musical with, I think, the music and the lyrics were by Rogers and... Uh, no, not better. By uh, uh, yeah, Rogers and 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 uh, and uh, Hart. And uh, that is now. I'm talking. This is now like about uh, 25, 28 years ago. And I uh, moved with my typewriter into my offices at uh, Columbia, and there was an executive dining room where like about 12 people were sitting around, and it was. Uh, and Harry Cohn was uh, kind of King Arthur at his, uh, in this case, oblong table. And menus, you know, he would raise hell if he didn't get the first copy, if that was kind of a, a thing that uh, it was the seventh uh, typewritten copy of the menu, he would just bang his fist down. And we would have be having lunch, discussing uh, the project. He was talking to a lot of other people. Sure. Under the table where to uh, to uh, buzz us, and uh, once in a while he would uh, uh, buzz for the uh, radio to be put on because he had a horse in some race in Hialeah, and he would like to know how it uh, came out. It was all. But when when he spoke, we just uh, shut up. So the idea then was that uh, I would make the picture. My idea then was because it is the love story between Pal Joey, sort of an, a dancer gigolo, young and a woman twice his age who is keeping him. And my idea then was to take Marlon Brando, who cannot dance, but he's a drummer, he's a fairly good drummer, to make him into Joey. And the woman who's keeping him, this is 28 years ago, Mae West, and everybody was... Uh, and we had sort of a couple of discussions there, A, in his, uh, in his office, which was... Um, it had... Uh, there are six here, he had like about 30 Oscars there. Whoever won for a Columbia picture, and those were the great days of Capra and uh, uh, all the pictures that he did, and other very good pictures. He would have a duplicate, which is kind of littered with that. 
So we had uh, we had a couple of lunches, and uh, I was there for about ten days. Uh, when suddenly I get uh, the news that uh, uh, he had discussed it in New York, and uh, Mr. Cohn had changed his mind, and he does he thinks that's bad casting, and the whole idea is just bad, and forget about it. Well, I didn't say a word. I I uh, I just uh, packed up my typewriter. I didn't ask for anything, and I just moved out. And about a week later, I got a bill. Two lunches, four dollars. That was if the lunch was like two dollars, you know, for the executive. That was in those days. Two lunches, four dollars. That was my. That, those were my business dealings with with Harry Cohn. <laughs> so sometimes I would see him. Uh, we would uh, drive out together to Santa Anita to the racetrack, and uh, but uh, uh, or I would go to his uh, house. He would have a projection room and. Uh, he he was he was tough. He uh, he he was tough. He was lucky. He was a good gambler. He, he had all those great years with Capra, and that is the proper man for you to talk to, Frank Capra, because he was there for almost all his all his life. I knew I knew Goldwyn better. Also, I only did that one picture. But I had uh, when I worked with uh, with um, uh, for United Artists. I had my offices on the Goldwyn lot, and we had lunch very often. He had a uh, he had a cook who used to cook uh, lunches there, and he would very often have lunch with me, and we would be discussing uh, the status of the industry. But that was um, after his uh, glory period, you know, with uh, with Weiler and the other directors. That was when he was in uh, uh, kind of uh, after after Porgy and Bess. I think that he kind of uh, uh, eased down, you know. But uh, 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 those were the days, you know, when, uh, when, uh, uh, of course, I don't have to tell you, most of the Goldwynisms, you know, are not true. You know, some were true. I, I, I lived to some myself. One day I remember that was in the bigger dining room. There were like about twelve of us, uh, <coughs> directors and actors, or something was shooting on the lot. And I remember he came in and he said, uh, during lunch, he said, uh, he I was about to tell a Goldwyn anecdote, which sort of amused me because, as I said before, you know, I, I know that there is there are 5,000, you know. I do think that he did say, uh, include me out. I do believe that he did say, in two words, impossible. You know, but I don't think that this is a malaprop. I think that there's pure genius. The impossible is two words to me, and and include me out is a strong exclude me. It's beautiful that anybody can think of that. This anecdote uh, uh, is about uh, Goldwyn coming to the dining room, one of the larger dining rooms, on the Goldwyn lot, and there were writers, directors, and uh, actors, and uh, producer or two, and he says, uh, gentlemen, he says, Last night, you know, I previewed my last picture in Pomona. He says, I have had successes in my life. He says, but nothing like what happened last night. When the picture was over, people got up and cheered for 15 minutes. And somebody at the table says, I was there, Mr. Goldwyn. And Goldwyn right away says, we can fix it. So this sort of is uh, that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, 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 we had, uh, in a, I think we had a bit of dialogue in Ball of Fire, a picture I wrote with Bracket, and we were going through that thing, and he says, Listen, boys, I will not make publicity for any French wine, any French aperitif, or whatever you call it. He says, oh, What do you mean, Mr. Goldwyn? He says, oh, read, read what you wrote here. It said, uh, After dinner, it was kind of an elegant dinner, how about the little Debussy? And he confused Debussy with Dubuffet, with, uh, with uh, Dubonnet. Just, just a little confusion uh, between a composer, uh, Mr. Debussy, and a little uh, Dubonnet. So we explained to him, no, Debussy was a quote. Yes, of course, I know what I'm talking about, naturally. I was just kidding. No, this would come right away on top of that. But uh, 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 there, was a, there was a kind of around those people, you know, where there were little whirlpools of excitement. There was... Uh, uh, they, 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 they had big plans, you know. They, 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 they had courage. They, they, Mr. Goldwyn always made pictures with his own money. You know, he was really an independent producer. Indeed, you know, there was no bank loans, no nothing. He just really, he 
he believed in something and he backed you up. And then, of course, after the product was done, you know, that enormous machinery, I mean, they have it now at Universal, but Universal, of course, it's a, uh, it's really kind of a huge Nutsberry farm, you know. You explain to the gentleman what the Nutsberry farm is. It's sort of a lunar park. It is a, a restaurants and hotels and 15, 20, 25,000 tourists a day driving to that lot and uh, they're seeing a show of stuntmen and uh, a phony opening of the Red Seas or whatever and the phony shark there from uh, Jaws and uh, and uh, uh, they have they have a catalog uh, I mean uh, 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 mail order houses in Colorado they have banks in Montana I, I, I don't know exactly whether I'm correct but this kind of an it is a whole different business they are in. On the side, they also make pictures. They make, they make I don't know, 10, 12, 16 hours of television every week. And business, well, once in a while, a sting happens, or a Jaws, or a Jaws, too, they get lucky. But uh, as a rule, you know, I would think that their level of thinking is, uh, is, uh, is um, rather low, I would think. Did you know Carl Lemley? Uh, Carl Lemley was before my time. But of course, I suppose some. I, I came here just as he was selling the studio. It would have taken over by the time you, you, you arrived. It, it was being sold at that time, if I remember correct. What about Mayer? <laughs> Mayer, I only knew once, and and that was a. a I mean, I, I, I we had uh, worked at, uh, at at Metro only once. Mr. Brackett and I were on a loan to, to MGM. We were working on the script for Mr. Lubitsch, uh, Ninochka. And uh, en passant, I would meet him, and I would just... Sometimes I saw him through the window, he would be talking to Mickey Rooney, and I overheard kind of things. He says, You are Andy Hardy. You are the American flag. I don't want to see you drinking again. You are the spirit of America. You are what this country is. Kind of really flag-waving and patriotic and God knows. And... Uh, I remember one time I finished a picture called uh, Sunset Boulevard and uh, there was a lot of talk about it and there was one showing for the industry in the big theater at Paramount on the Paramount lot and uh, it was a kind of a kind of a really kind of fine experience because it went great and people were very enthusiastic except I was walking down and not just down the few steps there from the projection room it was milling with people who were all over me and uh, and and Swanson was there and the actresses were kissing the hem of her skirt and to Christ it was a Trump and um, except there was one little group down there and that was Mr. Louis B. Mayer with his uh, henchmen Eddie Mannix Benny Thaw uh, uh, all the people you know around him the staff of Napoleon and he was furious I could overhear with one ear he says this is the most disgraceful thing to do to Hollywood. Feeding the hand, uh, biting the hand that is feeding you. And he went on and on. And this man didn't really know my name, but feeling great and elated and really on top. And I just went up to him and said, Mr. Mayor, uh, my name is Billy Wilder. I'm the director of this picture. And why don't you go and fuck yourself? And the, the, the people around him, they, they thought they're gonna, I thought they are going to faint, you know, that a man would dare to say that. To Louis B. Mayer, the Mughal of Mughals. I just couldn't care less. Did he reply? Or was he dead? No, he was absolutely stunned. Nobody could dare to say anything like this. Uh, maybe, maybe Mr. Goldwyn told it to him when they separated because they were in partnership at all time. Or maybe he and Harry Warner, I understand, they had some fist fights or stuff like that. But a, a writer with an accent, a writer-director with an accent, a small fish there in that enormous aquarium known as, 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 as Hollywood. That was my, my encounter. Zanuck, I, I only did one picture for, that was Seven Year Age. He was a, a good picture maker. He was, he was on a, a, I mean, intellectually, he was, he was quite a few pegs above Mr. Louis B. Mayer. Not power-wise, but intellectually. Selznick was absolutely, uh, Selznick and Thorberg, whom I never met, uh, they, were, they were naturally some pegs above that. But those were the easy days, you know. Sometimes I wonder, 
what would happen to a Thorberg or a Selznick nowadays. That's interesting. How would they operate today? With I just I just could not tell you. If they operated well, they would have needed one ingredient that is enormously important right now, and that is luck. The right picture at the right time. I know that they would have done him superbly. They would not have spared the rat or the, 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 the money. It Before it went out, it was shimmering. It was as good as anybody could make it because they had that power to get the best, no matter what the cost. But uh, I wonder, I just cannot answer it. You see, I surmise, and I might be totally wrong, you can probably correct me, that something like Sam Dolby, who was totally independent, such an independent man, he couldn't operate today. Uh, you mean the cost of the pictures, but they are? That would be prohibited. And by being prohibited, he would have to borrow money. And by borrowing money, he loses some of his independence and power. Well, not only that, but also a lot of money. You see a picture that you make for $10 million. Uh, you pay a million dollars, uh, it costs 11. And if it takes two years, it, it costs it cost, uh, 12 million, uh, uh, more than 12 million now, right? Uh, that's 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 quite possible. I don't know. I just I just uh, I just think that. Uh, and mind you, I think that we are among all of what's happening here, making very very much better pictures than we've ever made before. There are some pictures that still hold up, but I think there's a great deal of nostalgia which makes us overrate a lot of pictures that we kind of keep very dear to our hearts. But you look at them; they were not quite that good, and they were not quite that good because the audiences were not quite that good. The audiences now are far superior, of course. They are intellectually much higher. I'm talking about the good audiences. It, it, it just... Uh, but what would have been interesting would have been, you know, those picture people. Those picture people, how would they function today with that liberty that we have? Of course, they would have, they would have handled it with the greatest tact, but still in all, you know... The, the idea that, that a, a, a Selznick had to fight for months and to go to New York back and forth to be permitted to have that last line, frankly, I don't give a damn, the word damn. And also, that, the other aspect, they're getting money totally in it altogether uh, and talking about liberty, whereas you might have been the one person who told Louis B. Mayer to go and fuck off. Yeah. Nowadays... Uh, because people are used to total freedom uh, and, and, and indiscipline, they would not be willing to submit themselves to the kind of sort of... Well, that is a point, that's a very, very good point, and uh, that's, that's what makes picture-making so so um, so uh, difficult today. And I, I meant to make a point of it, and I'm glad that you uh, threw me that cue there, because, uh, uh, you see, there are no actors under contract anymore. They are all freelancers, and they are now co-producers... Uh, they have their lovers direct them or produce the pictures of them. A man like John Trivota, a marvelous young talent. I was talking about Trivota, just a shining, wonderful uh, 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 young talent. He's, uh, he is uh, in his early 20s. I understand he made a deal with the company where he has the final cutting rights on the picture. I mean, all of those things would have been totally impossible. And uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, the, the 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 power of the agents, unless they have become the 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 heads of studios, you know, the way the way you're being pushed around, the ass kissing that is going on, and then the people who become producers suddenly there is some uh, uh, agent, third echelon, who through some fluke. Uh, uh, was tipped off that there are galleys of a novel that may, and he puts down a, 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 a an option money, and suddenly he finds himself in control of a, of a bestseller. And now he says, "Ha ha!" But I am the producer. He's never been inside the studio. He does not know what those holes on the side of the film, the sprockets, what they're for. Uh, it just, but he is the producer now. This is. Uh, this is the the, 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 the the thing that would make it uh, that makes it impossible for a for a pro to live with. And therefore, Goldwyn would never be able to operate. No, Goldwyn would have uh, no you could, uh, no Thorbeck. It is a question of uh, it is a, a question of, of ultimately a question of, of, of dignity of living with yourself. You know, you cannot you cannot do that. You know, it is just uh, it it uh, this industry kind of abounds with indignity. But you have to play ball if 
you are if you are to go on. Just one final point, Mr. Wilder. Yes. We'll take around is what would you say was the great contribution of the nobles? I mean, we know, we know the obvious things, but the great common contribution that was true of all of them, whatever their individual characteristics. Well, I, 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 as I said before, they were, they were the ones, silent pictures, uh, 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 then uh, the advent of sound, they were the ones that have, that have done the greatest, greatest publicity job for this country. It, it was not the, uh, the, the, the Ford automobiles. It was, it was uh, not the chewing gum. It was the, 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 the myth of this supercontinent that they sort of brought, uh, that, they, the, 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 that they photographed and showed around the world, whether it was Chaplin or, or Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire, Douglas Fairbanks, it, 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 it incited the, 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 the imagination of the world. I myself, I was not that naive, but I, I, was just, uh, I was just madly in love with this guy. I had to come. I, had to, it, the, 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 I came down to earth after I came here, but uh, you, you went to that same experience, I'm, self, I'm sure, yourself. Thank you very much.